a South Asian, oops, in a South Asian context today. Uh, if we could move to the next slide. Okay, and then, so what is cyber warfare? Um, cyber warfare is the use of cyber attacks against a nation or state with the intent to cause harm upon it. Cyber attacks generally are just attempts to gain access to computer systems with sensitive data. Um, and then we have some examples listed there at the bottom of the slide. Um, viruses, which can take down critical infrastructure, um, attacks that prevent legitimate users from targeting computer networks and devices, um, hacking and theft of critical data from institutions, governments, businesses, and propaganda or disinformation campaign, ca campaigns used to cause serious disruption or chaos um, in a country. Usually they're like related to like politics in the, in the country. Great, so can we go to the next slide, please? So why are these issues important? Uh, the global cyber threat continues to evolve at a rapid pace, and there are a lot of rising number of data breaches each year. And the main issue with this is that cyber criminals can collect medical, financial, business, and governmental data. And these can threaten a lot of existing systems that we have, both in the public and private sector. Another aspect to consider of this issue is the cost. Um, as corporations predict that a worldwide spending on cybersecurity solutions will, will re reach a massive $133.7 billion by 2022. So there's a huge financial cost of this to consider as well. So having the background of these issues in mind, um, it's going to be very helpful to consider these factors um, once our panelists come and they should be here shortly. Hello, Dr. Wolf, thank you for joining. Hi, sorry, I was running a little late. I hope you went ahead and got started without me. Yeah, no worries. We're actually waiting on Mr. Chakravarti right now, but um, let me just introduce you first. So Dr. Josephine Wolf is an Associate Professor of Cybersecurity at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And currently her research includes international in internet governance, cybersecurity, security responsibilities, and the liability of online intermediaries. Um, her Book, you'll see this message when it's too late. The legal and economic aftermath of cybersecurity breaches was published in 2018. And her writing on cybersecurity has been featured in Slate, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and Wired. Um, yeah, just wait a few more minutes for Mr. Shapiro. Oh, he's here. Um, welcome, Mr. Shapiro. Hi, good afternoon. My apologies. I had some. Trouble dialing in uh, this morning. Absolutely no worries. Um, Mr. Ravi Shankar Chaturvedi is the D Director of Research, Lecture in Global Business, and Doctoral Research Fellow for Innovation and Change at the Fletcher's Institute of Business and Global Context. He's also a founding member and co-head of the Digital Planet uh, team, an interdisciplinary research initiative um, dedicated to measuring the global internet economy and understanding the impact of digital innovations in the world. Um, thank you so much for you both and your time. Um, I'd like to now ask both panelists to present their opening remarks. Um, if you could keep these to about two minutes, that'd be appreciated. Um, let's start with you, Mr. Chaturvedi. Oh, I was actually hoping you would you would start with Professor Wolf, uh, but uh, <laughs> hi, Professor Wolf, how are you? Great to see you again. Um, 
Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having uh, uh, having me uh, join this panel. I what I thought I'd probably do is set some context, uh, specifically given that this is really uh, about South Asia. And if I'm able to share my screen, what I would like to do is kind of walk us through what the digital context of you know uh, of the, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, where do you know at least four. Uh, four of the biggest, uh, you know, countries in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, uh, where do they stand uh, in, uh, you know, on, on various aspects of, uh, you know, uh, various foundational aspects that inform their digital journeys. Uh, so if I can share my screen real quick. Um, there you go, I think I can, but let me just one second. Let me just... Um, Can everybody see my screen? So uh, I will yeah. drop links to this. This is the digital intelligence index that uh, that we developed. And several of you, uh, I'm, I'm hoping at least from the undergraduate uh, program uh, are a part of, the, part of our digital uh, intelligence, uh, digital planet research program. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what we do, uh, what this is, uh, and what you're all seeing is a study that we do uh, looking at the digital evolution uh, of 90 countries around the world. Uh, and uh, on, on the y-axis here is uh, the state of digitalization, which is informed by four, uh, you know, four major sort of factors, uh, you know, conditions of demand, uh, you know, uh, which uh, include all aspects of uh, digital consumption, uh, the readiness and sophistication of consumers, uh, what kind of digital uptake there is in, in the country, et cetera, et cetera. Conditions of supply, uh, what kind of infrastructure exists, uh, not just hard infrastructure, uh, you know, which is uh, telecommunications, et cetera, et cetera, all kinds of soft digital infrastructure, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then looking at institutions, to what extent are institutions enabling digital progress? Uh, you know, uh, what is the core law and order function of a country? Are institutions enabling, you know, uh, you know, are, are they market friendly? Are they enabling? Uh, you know, businesses to take root and uh, and so on and so forth. And more importantly, uh, how are institutions uh, primed uh, to uh, advance uh, their digital economies? Uh, so that uh, is yet another sort of factor. The, th the fourth factor is innovation and change that is happening either because of or in spite of uh, these, uh, these uh, you know, th the other forces that I, uh, that I just outlined. Uh, when we combine those, uh, what you get is uh, the state of digitalization of a country, uh, which is uh, the y-axis that you see, and then the rate of digitalization, how have countries been progressing over time? Uh, and this is 12 years of uh, data all the way from 2009 to 2019, uh, 160 data points, uh, you know, comparable across these 90 countries over 12 years. So that's a, that's a pretty powerful data set that you're seeing uh, crystallized in here uh, for us to see. Now, if I punch in uh, the four countries that we mentioned, India, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, and let's see where they are. So what we see is India and Bangladesh seem to have a lot of momentum, uh, relatively speaking, uh, and a lot of headroom for growth. Uh, and Pakistan and Sri Lanka are, uh, you know, both low on their state of evolution and slow in their momentum. And you could, I could, I could, you know, we could do this in in several ways. We could we could compare uh, their trajectories. Uh, and I urge you all to kind of look at these things uh, in great detail here on absolute state. You could compare them to, you know, uh, some kind of an aspiring upper middle income. Uh, you know, median, and what you see is clearly that you know uh, all countries have you know uh, lack a certain amount of demand sophistication. Uh, all you know, some countries have you know, India especially has made a lot of progress on uh, on its institutions. Still, a lot of headroom for growth on demand, uh, and and there is a there is a gap. Uh, that they can fill on supply infrastructure. 
Now, uh, you could do that for several other countries. Again, Bangladesh, lots of room to grow. Pakistan, similar, and Sri Lanka. So uh, what I would, I'm actually gonna drop this link for you all to kind of play with it. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I kind of wanna, uh, you know, uh, kind of wanna say that, you know, we are looking at a region which accounts for about, you know, at least a fourth of humanity uh, between uh, the four countries. Uh, where there is a tremendous potential for, uh, you know, and headroom for growth uh, from a digitalization perspective and a lot of opportunity for cooperation. Um, so I kind of want to pause there and, and, and uh, hand it over to Professor uh, Wolf to, uh, uh, for her uh, remarks. Sure, well, thank okay. you so much. You. What a, oh, go ahead, sorry. I, I was just gonna thank Mr. Chapter Ravi and I encourage everyone to mess around that tool um, I'm actually part of the Digital Planet team, and so it's awesome to, to see people engage with our research. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear from you, Dr. Wolf. Thank you. Um, really, really fascinating uh, Digital Planet project. Thank you so much for showing some of that. That's always really enlightening. Um, what I would say about cybercrime in South Asia is that it's a relatively understudied area um, in this domain, right? There's a lot more work that's been done on cybercrime in Southeast Asia. There's a lot more work that's been done on cybercrime in the Middle East. There's a lot of work that's been done on cybercrime in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, and so when we're thinking about South Asia, we are dealing with some of the worst statistics in an already pretty weak set of statistics worldwide for trying to understand what the cybercrime landscape looks like, who's conducting those crimes. Um, it's not our sense that South Asia is a hotbed of criminal activity in, in the terms of kind of criminals making a base out of those countries or the uh, online infrastructure there, right? We think that like, that's much more common in Malaysia. We think that's much more common in uh, parts of Eastern Europe. Um, we do think that there is a fair bit of cybercrime targeting People, certainly in India, we have some, some data, they're not great data to, to track kind of what some of those trends have looked like, especially during COVID with more people working remotely and relying on computer infrastructure. Um, but on the whole, I would say it's been a region that has been neglected to a large extent by people working in this area. Um, I think there are a couple of reasons for that that we can get into more during the discussion. Um, but I would say it's a combination of perhaps slightly slower rates of internet penetration in which you don't see sort of either a huge target uh, for criminals or a kind of important intermediary hot point for criminals there. Um, and also a kind of interesting set of internet policies that don't necessarily make it a very conducive region to setting up a lot of criminal enterprise there. Um, and, and so I think sort of one of the things that's interesting to me is thinking about how, how South Asia manages to proliferate internet penetration pretty quickly over the past several years, but also perhaps avoid some of the pitfalls of the countries that have become home to really extensive and damaging cybercrime rings. Um, and, and that's one of the things I hope we'll explore a little bit today. Thank you so, both so much. I, uh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Jim. And you were saying, please, please interject. I, I was quick. No, I was I was about to uh, you know uh, nod uh, in 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 agreement with everything that Professor Wolf said uh, when when Professor Wolf you mentioned that uh, Malaysia is a bit of a hotbed. Uh, it took me back to uh, my own days back in when I used to run payments businesses in the region when whenever uh, card skimming uh, for credit card skimming was uh, was was uh, a you know rife in Thailand and Malaysia and whenever our customers would travel to that region we'd replace their cards because uh, you know uh, likely their cards would have been compromised so it looks like they've advanced uh, on that front um, and uh, I, I also want to uh, agree with Prosobul's comment about institutional barriers uh, uh, the very barriers, ironically, that inhibit digital progress in the region seem to be inhibiting criminal activity as well. And that's a bit of a bit of an interesting uh, uh, angle there. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I'd just like to thank you so much uh, for those introductory remarks um, and like to pass it on to Akash now uh, for the moderate section. Thanks, Jivan, and thank you, Mr. Chaturvedi and Dr. Wolf. Um, I actually am really curious um, a little bit about what specific barriers you might see 
um, that have both inhibited digital progress in South Asia, but that have also inhibited inhibited cybercrime activity. But I, before we get to that, I want to ask just a couple of general questions um, for those attendees who maybe are not so familiar with the cybersecurity landscape globally. Um, and then we can zoom in really quickly on, uh, on South Asia. Um, but for those of us um, in the Zoom call who might be a little bit unfamiliar with some of the challenges that we're seeing in 2021 in cyberspace, um, what are those challenges? You know, are we looking at a lot of state-sponsored activity? Are we looking at a lot of cybercrime activity? Um, can you sort of give us a lay of the land of, of uh, cyberspace in 2021, really? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at it first, and you can add anything I've forgotten. Um, I think when we look at the lay of the land right now, we're seeing a pretty significant combination of state actors and non-state actors. Um, what I would say is sort of important to keep in mind about the non-state actors is that in many countries, in almost every country where there's a sort of significant cyber criminal organization operation, those crime rings are being tolerated or supported or actively promoted in some cases by the government in most of those places, right? There is, I would say, nowhere that you have a massive cyber crime operation that the local government is actively trying to stop because we actually can do that, right? You know, we, we do have the tools to track down large financially motivated cyber criminal operations um, if they are within our borders and our jurisdiction. Uh, so right, Russia would be kind of the classic example of this where you see some private criminal entities operating at very large scale independent of the government, but in various degrees of cooperation or, you know, willingness to look the other way, at least, right? And in contrast to that, if you look at a country like China, you see a lot of cyber activity, certainly, right? Some, you know, very significant espionage uh, capabilities, but much less privatized sort of criminal stuff happening around the edges. Um, and, and so I would really emphasize, you know, you, you're seeing both, you're seeing all possible combinations of private operations, government operations, uh, mixes of the two. You're seeing a lot of ransomware, uh, won't, won't surprise anybody here probably. Um, you're also seeing sort of continued espionage efforts, the shift to remote work and kind of more online meetings and remote access has of course enhanced that. Um, you're seeing still an enormous amount of financial fraud being perpetrated, um, and that looks like a whole bunch of different things. That can look like the theft of payment cards, but it can also look like fraudulent transfers out of bank accounts. Um, there's a lot of sort of sending fake invoices to companies and saying, please transfer the, you know, this amount for the services we've rendered to you. Um, that stuff is, is more effective than you would think or hope it would be. Um, so all of those things, I think, are, are very much in play. I'd say the extortion piece is a big focus right now for a lot of countries, thinking about ransomware, thinking about kind of all of the variations on online extortion, many of which rely on cryptocurrency payments and what it might mean to cut down on that. Um, and I, the thing I would say about that that I think is perhaps especially relevant if we're thinking about the South Asia region is that those are the kinds of cyber attacks that you usually see the costs of being borne by individuals, right? So when you think about like the theft of payment card numbers, that is something that first of all, is only gonna affect people who already have credit cards. Um, and second of all, most of the time, the costs of that are not being borne by me, they're being borne by my bank or my credit card provider because I'm gonna you know, say, oh, this was stolen, I shouldn't have to pay those charges. When you're talking about something like ransomware, that can affect everybody who has a device, right? There, that's no longer sort of limited to a particular population. And I no longer have somebody else that I can go to and say like, you should have to pay for this. You know, this, this wasn't my fault. Um, and so you see this real kind of decentralization of the costs in a way that, to my mind, is, is sort of very damaging for the population of people who are perhaps not accustomed to protecting themselves against certain types of cybercrime and did not have a kind of background in the earlier forms of cybercrime that were more focused on payment cards and on other types of theft. Absolutely, and if I may, if I may add to what Professor said, uh, you know, uh, the the low and slow state of 
digitalization and low digital sophistication, not just among consumers, but also by institutions, makes them uh, a target for uh, all kinds of cyber crime. So if you all recall, uh, I think it was in 2016, uh, the Bangladesh Bank, the, which is the federal bank of Bangladesh, was uh, hackers, uh, you know, managed to uh, managed to pull out what was it close to about a hundred uh, close to about a hundred million uh, out uh, uh, of the bank and that primarily accounts for and what and funnily enough what made them spot it was a printer error uh, otherwise the money would have actually you know a lot more uh, would have been would have been swindled uh, out of them so uh, so that's something that you know also hurts countries so in some sense their inability or uh, lack of digital sophistication at an institutional level uh, also comes to hurt. Well, actually, I, I think I'll, I'll make that my next question. You know, so when we talk about the institutional challenges in South Asia, as far as securing cyberspace, um, not just governments, but banks, big corporations, um, what sort of barriers are we seeing those institutions face in successfully protecting individuals from bearing the costs of cyber criminal or, or even state-sponsored cyber activity? Well, I think you're starting with a, with a big assumption there, which is that protecting individuals from these costs is their priority. Um, and, and I think that sort of historically, it's not clear that's been the case. Um, in the past, and by the past, I mean like 15 years ago, which for people like me who study the internet is, you know, the, the equivalent of medieval times, um, I would say it's sort of organically been the case that a lot of the costs are being borne by payment networks and banks. Um, and that's because those were the those were the financial intermediaries you, you needed to go through if you wanted to steal money. Um, and so it's not so much that there were protections for individuals as those were there, there was no way around that if you were hoping to steal millions of dollars. I mean, what you see with the rise of cryptocurrency is the ability to circumvent those intermediaries, right? The ability to say, okay, you know what, MasterCard, Visa, they generally good job, arguable, but let's let's just say, uh, you know, enhancing payment security. Um, I don't want to have to go through them anymore because they're gonna cancel all the credit card numbers I steal immediately. Why don't I get all of my payments in Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever else? Um, and the thing about those cryptocurrency systems, and, and I'm sure you will be able to tell just from my comments how I feel about them, which is certainly not how everybody feels about them, but the thing about them is they're really designed to be outside the reach of government and policymaker. That's kind of their whole motivating purpose, is to say you're going to untether yourself from the sort of centralized bank currency system. Um, and so so I'm, I'm sympathetic to the challenges of trying to sort of reconfigure those systems so that they are more regulable and better sort of better able to protect individuals at the same time i think if that's where the criminal activity has moved then that's what you have to do right if, if the cryptocurrencies are one of the key enabling forces which i would say they are here then you have to be willing to sort of enter into that space and tackle it seriously and i think you're seeing some willingness right i think you're seeing a variety of countries including the united states but many others starting to say, we really have to, to sort of get into this now. Um, it, it's a slow process. It will continue to be a slow process. Um, it's made slower by the fact that most of the people who do financial regulation either don't understand how these systems work or don't really like them in the first place and don't really want to. Um, but I think, I think that's been one of the biggest barriers that you're dealing with a sort of financial transaction mechanism that was deliberately designed to only empower individuals and not to sort of give any authority or power to those intermediaries. And so to then try and insert intermediaries who can help bear the costs and provide protection is really difficult. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So I will ask the last question that that we had sort of in our general overview section, and it's you know we've talked about a lot of threats um, that have sort of generally existed in cyberspace. If you had to pick maybe one or two that are most directly relevant to to individuals and institutions in South Asia, what would you say are you know one or two things we should keep our eye on in the next two or three years um, that might directly target South Asia?
Go ahead. I just did a lot, a lot of, did a lot of talking. I, um, I'll, I'll take the first shot at it. Um, so, uh, uh, so one, one threat that, you know, uh, I personally see is the development of, uh, again, uh, from a consumer perspective, uh, each of the countries is developing their own payment networks that are domestic. And, uh, and clearly they're making rapid uh, advances. I mean, uh, India, for example, has uh, financial inclusion in India has gone uh, up from what was uh, low 30s uh, to roughly about 70, 75%, depending on how you measure it. Uh, you know, people's the bank account and or some kind of a digital wallet. Now, that means that, you know, there is a, a tremendous amount of usage uh, of some digital forms of money happening uh, without adequate levels of literacy, digital literacy. Uh, so what that ends up creating is uh, vulnerability uh, at, a, at a very large on a, on a very large surface area of consumers who probably don't know enough about how to protect themselves uh, and the lack of institutional mechanisms that uh, that protect consumers. So that's one. The second is these payment systems and uh, you know and rails in and of themselves that are domestic in nature. Uh, they are, again, connecting it back to my earlier observation about how the Bank of Bangladesh uh, was victim uh, of a uh, cyber, uh, you know, um, cyber uh, theft activity uh, or, or hacking activity. Uh, these payment systems, insulated as they are from the global system, means that they are more vulnerable. Uh, so the lack of, you know, uh, and and big networks, uh, global networks, uh, be it a SWIFT, a Visa, a MasterCard, whoever, whoever it is, uh, folks who are engaged in moving money around the world have capabilities that, uh, you know, can identify, uh, you know, threats coming from the outside. Uh, insulated payment networks, uh, you know, or insular rather payment networks uh, tend to become, uh, you know, uh, very attractive, uh, you know, uh, targets for cyber criminals uh, looking for uh, an opportunity. So those are at least two that come to mind. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear what Professor Wolf thinks. So if I'm thinking about kind of two or three things to, to keep an eye out for, to, to work on, I think for me, one, as you've just heard me talk a lot about it, is the cryptocurrency ecosystem and sort of what it would look like to try and impose some of the same anti-money laundering, know your customer requirements on the cryptocurrency exchanges that turn fiat currency into cryptocurrency and vice versa. Um, and we're, we're definitely seeing some movement in that space. I think for that to be real, it has to be enforceable. And that's been the big problem so far, right? There are lots of sort of theoretical requirements for cryptocurrency exchanges, but the actual enforcement of them has been extremely lax in many places around the world, um, you're seeing, so just a couple weeks ago now, you saw sort of the first serious sanctions directed at an individual cryptocurrency exchange, the SUEX exchange. I think that will be an interesting test of sort of, is this about getting much more serious or is this still kind of signaling and symbolic? Um, and I'm probably a little too soon to say right now what that's gonna look like, but it's certainly the kind of step that could be about making this a little bit more real and a little bit more aggressively enforced. Um, I think another area to watch is going to be around regulation of ransom payment, right? So you can crack down on cryptocurrencies. You can also consider saying, we don't want people funding these criminals. We don't want people kind of giving their money directly to these crime organizations and thereby fueling future suicide or crime in this uh, way. And I think a lot of regulators are sort of thinking more and more about what are the circumstances under which they think it should be legal for ransoms to be paid and what kinds of restrictions might crop up around there. I think that would be another thing to pay close attention to. And then the third one, and this is a really basic one, but really important and maybe especially important for South Asia, where as I said, we've got you know, very few good statistics, very little good data about what the crime landscape actually looks like. So another one is really basic, but really important reporting requirements, um, right? So if you 
fall victim to ransomware? Do you have to report that to anybody? If you experience various kinds of cyber criminal activity or cyber sabotage, is there a mechanism for sort of collecting that data? Um, and that's, you know, that doesn't solve anything on its own, but it does give us a better starting point for trying to figure out what the problems are in different places and what the right next steps would be. I mean, you've got a very little bit of that in like the United States and the European Union, I would say, right? In the United States, most states, all states now have mandatory uh, reporting for breaches of personal information. So if your bank or your supermarket or Target or whoever else experiences a data breach, right? They have to send you one of those form letters that you've probably all seen at some point saying your social security number and your address and your phone number and your email address have all been breached. But that's really the only kind of incident that has to be reported. So everything we talk about when we talk about ransomware, we talk about denial of service attacks, and we talk about espionage, all of that we still don't really have any good data on. And that would be another area that I would say sort of worth watching and, and thinking about progress in that space moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I actually want to bring the conversation back to something that uh, Mr. Chaturvedi talked about a little bit earlier, which was sort of the increasing democratization um, in payment methods in South Asia. So we've seen, you know, in Bangladesh, uh, we've seen Easy Cash or B Cash in Sri Lanka, we've seen Easy Cash. Um, in India, we have Paytm, uh, Phone Pay. We have all sorts of, you know, cashless services um, that are dependent on citizens in those countries using, you know, their, maybe their mobile phones to pay. Um, is that, do you sort of see that, maybe Mr. Chaturvedi first, then Dr. Wolf, do you see that as an increasing vulnerability um, for individuals in South Asia, or do you see that maybe as more of a strength? Well, I was actually hoping to pull up another uh, trend line, but uh, uh, to answer this question, uh, it is both, right? It is both a strength and a vulnerability. I mean, what is happening on the one hand is there is greater uptake of digital payment methods, uh, particularly in India. It was, uh, you know, uh, it was forced on consumers. Uh, demonetization left many people with no choice but to plug in uh, and that created its own set of problems. Now, uh, there is, so on the one hand, there is uptake, there is usage uh, without a corresponding level of literacy. And that gap uh, will come back to bite. Uh, now, who will it bite? Big question. Uh, if, you know, if it bites enough voters, uh, then you know uh, some politicians uh, will end up taking uh, taking that up. Uh, if it you know uh, if it's if it's small enough, then you know um, if it's small enough, it ends up going uh, going and biting the uh, the merchants. But it will bite. It will bite. The lack of uh, that level of literacy is a problem. Uh, so if there is one thing that uh, all these governments uh, and even businesses that are interested in in advancing digital uh, activity uh, should be focusing on is raising levels of digital. Uh, basic uh, levels of hygiene. Uh, you know, you could call it cyber hygiene, you could call it digital hygiene. Uh, you know, that uh, is not keeping, uh, you know, uh, that's not keeping in pace with the levels of usage that you see. So, and that's problematic. That's problematic. So I think that's right. I think that's sort of when you when you ask, is that a more secure system or a less secure system? It always depends on what the alternative is. Um, and in this case, right, if the alternative is, say, an all cash based system, um, then I think there are security benefits and there are security disadvantages, right? So the security benefits have to do with sort of smaller scale one-off crime. It's harder for me perhaps to steal your, your digital wallet than it is to steal your cash. Me, it depends on, depends on sort of the security mechanisms and how it's being stored. On the other hand, if you're worrying about large scale cyber crime, then of course it's much easier for me to steal money stored on your phone than it is for me to steal money out of your pocket. Um, and so, so I think it sort of shifts what kinds of crime you worry about. Um, and, and that can be good or bad. I think the advantage to it from a, from a security standpoint is you've inserted more of those intermediaries I was talking about, right? So all of those companies you've just named now have some role and some potential kind of security 
that they can provide, um, it, it sort of gives me somebody to go to if my money is stolen and say, what happened? Can you make me whole again? Whereas if it's just kind of my money is, is taken out of my house or off my person, then you don't really have that in the same way. Um, but I think that depends a lot on who those intermediaries are and how much security and help they're actually providing. Um, and so it, it you know, really depends on what are the guarantees that they can make to their customers and how much do they have by way of safeguards for any kind of theft or, or financial crime. Mm -hmm. And I think we actually we, we see a couple of I see a couple of follow up questions in the chat that hopefully we'll get to in a few minutes um, about sort of that gap in digital literacy and how that might impact individuals bearing the brunt um, um, of sort of that activity in cyberspace. Um, but before we get to those questions, I want to zoom. I realize I'm jumping around a little bit between topics, but I want to come back to something we touched on very briefly um, at the at the beginning of the general questions, um, which was state sponsored activity. Um, and you know we have seen all of us I think have seen the flashy headlines. You know Russia is involved in the 2016 election. We saw some intervention by Iran, I think, in 2020. Um, you know, many of us have read uh, all across the news that there's some sort of flashy state-sponsored cyber activity going on. Going on. Um, but we haven't really seen that in South Asia. Um, and I, I kind of want to ask, first, you know, we've seen North Korea, China, Iran, to some extent the United States, Russia, develop offensive capabilities in cyberspace, and we've seen them deploy those capabilities. Do you see that on the horizon for states in South Asia developing those offensive capabilities in cyberspace? Um, and sort of on the flip side, do you see South Asian countries as victims of offensive capabilities of other countries? Uh, I guess maybe we can start with Dr. Wolf and then move to Mr. Chaturvedi. So I would say at the moment, and all of this could change, I don't see them as very big victims. Um, I think the reason is that there is much less online infrastructure in a lot of these countries than in the, the places that we typically think of being as the prime targets, North America, Western Europe, right? You, you are much more of an attractive target the more that your electric grid has been brought online, the more that your critical infrastructure is networked. Um, and I think right now, to my mind, we're still at the point with a lot of South Asian countries where the infrastructure is not so online as to be really vulnerable to a lot of those types of interventions. Um, that, that could certainly change. I think, you know, we could be having a very different conversation in two or five years. Um, in terms of whether those states themselves are developing these capabilities, my guess would be yes. My guess would be everybody right now, to some extent, is thinking about how do we develop our offensive cyber capabilities. Um, the one that I would say, you know, people would probably be most likely to fear in this context would probably be India, which has access to, you know, fairly extensive infrastructure and expertise in a lot of these areas and um, will probably turn out to be at some point in the not too distant future a serious player in this space. I'm, I'm just guessing that's not based on, you know, any particular capabilities or attack. It's just something that that government is clearly very interested in and involved in thinking about. Um, and I would expect other South Asian countries to also be sort of thinking about and worrying about this too. I think, you know, if India is developing cyber capabilities, it's a very likely scenario that Pakistan is also thinking about cyber capabilities that sort of nobody will want to be without them for very long. Um, I think the, the challenges there have to do with how much money and how much sort of computing infrastructure a country is willing to invest in this. And generally, I would say offensive cyber capabilities are something you invest in after you've taken care of the kind of basic computing needs of other critical infrastructure components of a country, right? It's not, it's not usually the thing you invest sort of your first set of servers in. You want to sort of make sure people are online. You want to make sure the communications infrastructure is reasonably robust. You want to make sure the online banking system is working reasonably well. And then you have some resources and some expertise and some time to devote to thinking about what the offensive capabilities might look like. Um, so I would say it hasn't been kind of top priority to my mind in a lot of these places, but I do think that will shift. And I do think that you will, you will sort of see and are probably already seeing growing interest there 
And, and one of the things that's actually a little bit hard to know about countries that haven't really exercised their cyber capabilities very actively yet is how much they've already accomplished. Right, we, we don't have a good way of saying sort of how sophisticated is India's cyber arsenal at this point because they haven't exercised it. And that might be because they don't have anything, but it might also be because they're waiting for the right moment and they're, you know, sort of looking for, for the opportunity. Um, and so it, it can often be a sort of very sudden shift. It's not like, say, developing nuclear weapons where you have a lot of lead time and everybody's kind of watching it happen. It's often much more of a sort of, oh, we thought they weren't a threat. And then one day they do something and we realize they really are. So Mr. Chaturvedi, have you seen sort of like any passion or maybe passions is the wrong word, but any, any enthusiasm in South Asian governments or even in the South Asian private sector to develop that sort of offensive cyber capability? Well, uh, who is this offensive cyber capability being used against is a question, right? I mean, everything that Professor Wolf said, I, I wholeheartedly agree with. Uh, I mean, if you look at, uh, let's just take two examples. Uh, WhatsApp in India is a minefield of misinformation. And a large part of it comes from the ruling uh, party and its, uh, its machinery. Uh, so in some sense, there are offensive capabilities. They are just using it uh, to misinform and create all kinds of disinformation within their own borders. Now, is it happening? Uh, you know, are, are, uh, if that is in any form a, a predictor, I fully agree with, uh, uh, with Professor Wolf that you know, India is the country to watch out for, uh, given that it's honing its disinformation, mis misinformation capabilities on its own people really, really well. Uh, so watch out for that. And, you know, what's to say that they can't turn those engines uh, against, you know, against Pakistan or Bangladesh or wherever it is, or, or you know, further abroad. So, so that. Yeah, that's, that's definitely super interesting. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Wolf and Mr. Chaturvedi for, for engaging with us uh, in, this, in this question and answer portion. Um, I know Jeevan wants to turn it back to the audience um, and maybe see if we have any interesting questions from them. Uh, thanks again, Jeevan. Yeah, now we'll take questions from the audience. So everyone feel free to leave a question in the chat. Um, first, let's start with Injin's question. Um, she says, in Myanmar, psychological warfare was used by the military junta to cause terror among the civilians. This can be seen through social media platforms and media. Likewise, resistance campaigns were started online. Can you touch upon the differences and connections between psychological warfare and cyber warfare? Whoever would like to answer this question. Well, I guess what I would say is I think that, you know, cyber warfare can take a lot of different forms or cyber attacks, perhaps more accurately, right? You, you see ones that are strictly financially motivated that I think we wouldn't think of as being really psychological in nature. Um, and then you see ones that clearly do have a sort of really significant psychological component uh, that when we're thinking about disinformation, when we're thinking about public shaming attacks, when we think about things like the data breach on Ashley Madison that released personal information about people who were looking for extramarital affairs, right? All of those are cases where I think there's a really significant psychological component. And so it all depends on kind of what data is being accessed and to what end. Um, one thing I'll say about sort of the psychological components is that from a legal standpoint, they're often very difficult to litigate. So if you're trying to sue a company, if you're trying to sue somebody over a cybersecurity incident, then that is a much more difficult form of harm to get a court to go along with than saying like, I lost a lot of money because of the cyber attack. Um, so I think we're still sort of trying to get a, a handle on how best to frame those kinds of harm and understand them in the legal and the political world so that they are, they are recognized and sort of not dismissed as in some way less real or less tangible than the financial harms or other types of consequences from cyber attacks. Um, thank you, Dr. Wolf. Um, Gallery asked a question that's well suited for Mr. Chaturvedi. Uh, could you expand on the gap in literacy about the cashless services and how that might affect people and governments in South Asia? How does lack of uh, literacy in usage affect governments and people? I mean, 
So if you think about this, uh, sure. I mean, on, you know, on the big difference, and let's just take two large, large countries, the United States and, and India, right? So if you were to, and, and there are any number of scams that happen on, you know, uh, old, uh, older uh, folks living in America, you know, taking their social security numbers and, and, and you know, and, and or, uh, you know, um, uh, stealing from their bank accounts and so on and so forth. Now, what you need in a place like the United States is it's for, you know, even if you, even if you get to a hundred, if you're a cyber criminal and you get to a hundred of them and you take about $5,000 from each of them, that's a pretty large, you know, uh, heist for lack of a better term. Now in a place like India, I could probably just get five cents out of every customer, but there are 500 million of them. And that's a pretty large number too. And that five cents is a lot of money for somebody who's living on $2 a day. And if those people are, you know, plugging into the digital economy without adequately knowing how to safeguard their, you know, uh, uh, their savings, that's problematic. So how could it affect them? It could affect them deeply. Uh, and it is incumbent, not just on the governments and governments come to everything, right? I mean, they are, on the one hand, they are, you know, there are so many priorities. What are they going to do? Uh, you know, give out COVID vaccines or, uh, you know, build roads or, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, build schools. Uh, so many other priorities that they that they are all struggling. With. So there needs to be some kind of a public-private partnership solution to raising levels of digital literacy and, uh, you know, uh, shall we just call it some levels of digital hygiene. Uh, because that will come back to that. So that's one. Uh, how will it affect governments? Look, um, if you all uh, recall what happened uh, during the, uh, in, in what was Andhra Pradesh, which now became two states, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh in India, uh, the microfinance uh, crisis in, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the previous decade. Uh, lots of private capital chasing, uh, you know, microloans and, uh, you know, farmers, smallholder farmers uh, being over lent to and getting overextended and committing suicides because they could not pay back. And that becoming a political, you know, a massive political issue. Uh, you can see these repercussions. Uh, you know, it's not like they haven't happened before. And could you see something very similar happening in the digital, you know, because of the, you know, this lack of digital literacy and digital hygiene? Absolutely. So is that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Arjun asks, do you, see, uh, do you foresee an attempt by South Asian governments, particularly by India, to tackle extensive disinformation prevalent in social media? Or do you see them using disinformation more as an offensive tool in pursuit of their own objectives? Uh, Dr. Wolf, if you have a comment. No, I think the answer is probably both, right? I think that, you know, one of the one of the tricky things for governments um, in general is there are forms of disinformation that many of them dislike and want to tamp down on. And there are also forms of disinformation that some of them turn out to find very useful. Um, and it's hard to, to sort of do an effective crackdown on one and not the other. I think what you see in India and in China right now are really sort of blatant uh, disinformation campaigns coming from the government. And, and, and well, I mean, from other countries too, but what I think is interesting about India and China and the reason I lump those together is they're very internally focused, right? If we compare that to say the Russian disinformation campaigns that you have read most about, those are gonna be more kind of outward facing. Those are gonna be more about influencing people in other countries. There's some within the country as well, um, no question. But I think that the, the idea that you're gonna be able to sort of wield this information the way you want to as a government, but also get rid of any of the disinformation you don't like is probably a little bit unrealistic. My guess is that how it's gonna happen is through the big social media platforms, right? So what you're gonna see is a lot of pressure from India on Facebook, on Twitter um, to sort of label or remove certain types of content. Um, and a lot is gonna come down to sort of how willing those platforms are to cooperate and to tailor their policies to the requests of those governments. Um, Ravi already brought up WhatsApp, right? Really important example owned by Facebook uh, very, very sort of 
fraught negotiations or regulatory threats and proposals right now coming out of India focused on that platform in particular. Um, and I think we can sort of imagine that expanding more broadly. Um, but I, I honestly think it's very unlikely that any of these governments are going to decide, you know, all this information is bad. We're never going to use it ourselves. I think it's a very tempting tool. And I think especially given how hard it is to eliminate completely, and it is extremely hard, right? I mean, there's, you know, even if you decided all this information was bad, it would still be an incredibly challenging way to, to crack down on things. Um, so once you've sort of made your peace with the fact that there's going to be some amount of disinformation out there, then I think it just becomes really tempting to use some of that yourself. Um, and I'm not sure I see sort of any solution to that. What Professor Wolf said, I, I fully agree. Uh, you know, uh, to your to the question, uh, the only thing that I would perhaps add is, Kui uh, Bono is a good question to ask. Who benefits? And clearly, as Professor Wolf outlined, uh, the government benefits from uh, you know, or the governments in this question, especially India and China, as she uh, rightly outlined, benefits from there being uh, you know a level of disinformation prevalent uh, that you know works to their advantage. So uh, where's the incentive to, to stamp it out? Thank you for those insights. Um, we have time for one more question. Uh, Mira asks, given shared democratic values, mutual concern over China's rise and IT sector ties, the US and India are logical partners in the global artificial intelligence race. How can the Biden administration best position itself for successful AI cooperation with India? Uh, we'd love to hear from both speakers. Um, so I think AI cooperation with India has not been a top priority of this administration or any US administration. Um, I think that the real focus around AI has been China and the real focus has certainly not been cooperation. Um, I would say what the US tech firms are probably most interested in from India is the collection of data, right? About sort of the population there. Um, and so I, I don't know that anybody in India would regard that as cooperation so much as just kind of using using that data for enhancement of US owned AI systems uh, in a lot of cases. I do think that sort of there's there's clearly a lot of collaboration between US tech firms and Indian branches of those firms as well as more local Indian firms themselves, uh, not just on AI, but on all forms of tech development. Uh, I don't I don't think that in great danger at the moment. I think that sort of cooperation is, is still pretty strong. I think that the challenging thing for India is probably thinking about how do you make that a more equal cooperation or more equal partnership and less of a sense that sort of all of those efforts are really ultimately serving the US tech firms most. Um, and I'm not sure that that's a priority of the Biden administration, to be honest, sort of making that a more equal partnership. I think their AI priorities are much more about strengthening the US AI industry rather than about sort of forging more international partnerships on that front. But we'll see. I, I may be wrong about that or I may be too cynical about what their priorities are. Oh, no, not cynical at all. I think I think uh, I fully agree with Professor Wolf on, on this. Uh, and uh, in some sense, uh, the one advantage that I see uh, or one potential cooperation, and it definitely won't be an equal partnership in that sense. Uh, there's at least three uh, decades of uh, cooperation between uh, U.S. businesses, uh, you know, uh, of all kinds, uh, for which India has been uh, the back office uh, provider of uh, tremendous amounts of services. Right uh, now, that you know could also help. So there's a lot of work, low-level work. Uh, that is needed to train uh, machines, right? Tagging, tracing, uh, every little uh, activity, which is cost prohibitive if it is done in the United States. Now, India being uh, a perennial source of, uh, you know, uh, good enough uh, and, and, and cheap labor uh, could help 
uh, advance that. Now, is that an equal partnership? It, it definitely is not. But could that create a ton of jobs in India? Absolutely, yes. Uh, so, so there's that. Uh, but I fully agree with what Russell have said. Uh, I don't think this is uh, this is or uh, you know even has to be the Biden administration's priority to create an equal partnership. If at all, uh, you know, it should be the the Indian administration's uh, you know uh, uh, priority to find ways to uh, punch above their you know current capabilities and rise up uh, to uh, to you know uh, uh, and 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 raise their level of uh, capabilities uh, to even aspire to an equal partnership or something even remotely close to that. Thank you so thank you so much, everyone. I think it was fitting to end in cooperation, however cynical. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining, and a big thank you to Dr. Wolf and Mr. Chaturvedi for taking their time to speak to us today. Um, I think everyone learned a lot, and please stay tuned for upcoming Sark events. Uh, be sure to follow our Instagram at Tough Sark and our Facebook page. Um, everyone, take care. Thank you. Thank you.